Hello and welcome to Vyond's Global Leadership Series where we interview current and former heads of state. Today with me is Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia and uh, the Global President of the Asia Society. Mr. Rudd, welcome to Vyond. Good to be on the program. Good to be back in Delhi. Wonderful. And congratulations on your new book. It's called The Avoidable War: The Dangers of a Catastrophic Conflict Between the US and Xi Jinping's China. I could I have to say it couldn't have been better timed. And uh, I think most wars are avoidable, but they end up being fought anyway. You're calling this one avoidable, but do you think it's still imminent? Well, I think you would only have to be a casual observer of the U.S.-China relationship to see that whether it's over Taiwan or other emerging deep strategic frictions, that what was once a remote possibility has now become a greater possibility. And so, for the first time in my long career of analyzing the United States and China. Going back to when I was a junior diplomat in Beijing, back in the Mesolithic period,、um, at least the 1980s,、um, it's the first time I've really become worried that these two may、uh, structurally be heading in that direction, possibly sleepwalking in that direction,、um, and therefore I thought I should put pen to paper and、uh, put forward some proposals as to how this could be avoided. So、you've been watching China and working with China since the 1980s. Did you see this coming? Did you see this taking shape? No, I didn't.、Uh, that's the honest answer. I thought、uh, China under Deng Xiaoping, under Jiang Zemin, under Hu Jintao, that basically were prosecuting a different pathway for China's future.、Uh, certainly, China was becoming stronger. But remember,、uh, Deng Xiaoping's axiom was for China to focus always on the development of its economy. And he said that this should continue for literally hundreds of years before China thought of a greater or wider global role. Xi Jinping has changed that. He's a much more assertive Chinese political leader and wants to change the status quo. And as a consequence, a reaction around the world, including from the United States, is unfolding. Does he reflect the aspirations of his people, or is this just one man's policy that is driving China in a direction that the world finds disturbing? Uh, that's an excellent question, for which none of us as foreign analysts can actually accurately answer it. I'd put it in these terms, however: within the Communist Party, which after all has 95 million members,、um, Xi Jinping is now the paramount leader, and he has taken the party in a direction much more Marxist, much more Leninist, and much more nationalist than his predecessors. Was that、um, written in the skies beforehand? Hard to say. I think not. I think the future was always left to be determined by、uh, the political leaders who preceded him. But Xi Jinping sees himself as a man of history, sees himself as the man of the moment, sees himself as a man in a hurry、uh, to get things done,、uh, and therefore he is of a radically different type. I think he's therefore immeasurably changed China's posture in the region and the world. But coming off the back of the Uh, success China has had in building its national wealth and power over some decades now. Is there any meaningful challenge to him within the Communist Party? Not really. That's the honest analytical question. My job way back when was、uh, Chinese Politburo politics, and、uh, it's、um, kind of my bread and butter、um, before I lurched down the food chain of life into Australian politics and ended up as Prime Minister. And so it's a field that I've always、uh, followed quite closely.、And、I think if we are being analytically honest about it, Xi Jinping in his first five years in office between 2012 and 2017 was remarkably, and some would say brutally, effective at eliminating his principal political opponents. They were purged, and as a consequence, there are no major alternative political figures within the central Chinese leadership now, and certainly no one who it seems to be. Uh, designated as a successor, so for those reasons,、uh, Xi Jinping will be reappointed unanimously, in my judgment, as General Secretary of the Communist Party for a near record third term、uh, at the 20th Party Congress. But I think we should also fasten our seatbelts and get ready for Xi Jinping to be China's paramount leader for the next three terms, taking us out to the late 2030s. In this book, you've proposed a framework called "Manage Strategic Competition to Avoid War." I want to tell our viewers more about what that is. Essentially, there are five sets of strategic red lines between the United States and China: Taiwan, and the subset of issues around that; South China Sea, 
disputed uh, maritime and territorial claims between China and um, a number of Southeast Asian states, uh, one of which is a U.S. treaty ally, the Philippines. The third is the East China Sea, involving a, another U.S. treaty ally, Japan, and disputes over Senkaku and Diaoyudao. The fourth is um, the rolling volatility of the Korean Peninsula. And the fifth is cyber and space, where there are attacks in the cybersphere every day of the week. Now, on any given day, these things can erupt and create an incident uh, because you've got so much hardware rolling around the region at the moment. Ships, planes, cyber, and others, other elements of state power as well. And so each of these has a potentiality to create a crisis. So my argument is you can either have the current system of push and shove, and I don't know if it's like this in Indian school playgrounds, but in Australian school playgrounds, push and shove works for a while until someone falls over, and then it's usually a fight. Well, the alternative is you have basic guardrails, strategic guardrails, which in this case are a series of, um, shall we say, protocols anchored in each side's understanding of the irreversible strategic red lines of the other. Now, I argue that is on balance more stabilizing than where we are now. Coming back to your point, I think school playground rules are universal, as are the, the rules of war, if there are any. I think uh, everyone, including Beijing... Why is it always boys, by the way, who push and shove? <laughs> Girls are smarter, I think. I think so, because... <laughs> As I reflect on my own childhood growing up in Australia, I don't remember girls playing push and shove. It was just my gender. <laughs> Coming back to war, I think, uh, like the rest of the world, Beijing is also watching very carefully what's happening in Ukraine. How do you think Russia's invasion of Ukraine has informed Beijing's policy on Taiwan? The honest answer is not a lot. There's a lot of, I think, uh, loose analysis around whether Putin's invasion has emboldened, frightened Xi Jinping for the future. I don't think either is the case. China is proceeding on its own strategic timetable, its own strategic railway tracks on the future of Taiwan. And I'm deeply concerned, therefore, about the possibility of unilateral Chinese action, say in the late 20s, early 30s, when China is more fully militarily and economically prepared. However, if there's one learning for China out of Taiwan, sorry, out of Ukraine, I think it is this. Both China and Russia have been surprised by the degree of European solidarity. They've been surprised by uh, the extent to which the Europeans didn't simply collapse in on themselves like a bowl of marshmallow. It isn't winter yet. That's true. But um, given the invasion occurred in February, and we are now uh, heading towards September, uh, there's been a reasonable degree of unprecedented uh, European solidarity on this question from NATO, from the European Union, and from elsewhere, by individual uh, European member states. Do you think uh, the Chinese are going to invade immediately? Uh, most assessments are that it'll take a few years, but the way things are building no, up... No, I don't accept the logic that um, China plans, let's call it an armed assault on Taiwan, whatever form that takes... Uh, until the late 20s and early 30s. And there's a reason for it. Militarily, the PLA still feel underprepared, uh, financially and economically, because China depends on the dollar-denominated SWIFT system, financial settlements worldwide, both for trade and investment and capital markets, that and for those reasons, the imposition of Western sanctions would be devastating for the Chinese economy. So China will wish to strengthen itself both militarily, financially, and economically in terms of a greater degree of self-reliance before it uh, rolls the dice on Taiwan. So I'm much more concerned about late 20s, early 30s. That would still fall within Xi Jinping's political career, given that uh, he wants to be seen in Chinese communist history as the man who completed Mao's revolution. How committed do you think uh, the U.S. is to the Taiwan cause, if I may? Now, what's interesting, if you look at the barometer of political opinion in the United States, the answer to your question is increasingly so, um, partly because of the nature of the U.S.-China broader strategic competition, but partly because um, uh, there are both constituencies in the Republican Party and the Democratic Party which admire Taiwan's progressive democratization and Taiwan entering into the wider family of democracies. Would they go to war over Taiwan? Separate question. 
interestingly, opinion polling in recent times has indicated that if China launched a military assault on Taiwan, there is a clear majority of American support for the deployment of American naval and air power, uh, but a only minority support for the use of U.S. ground forces. Do you see Nancy Pelosi's visit as a needless provocation or a move that had to be made to show solidarity for Taiwanese democracy? Well, solidarity um, between the United States and Taiwan existed uh, well prior to the Pelosi visit. The problem with the Pelosi visit is that um, it um, fools around with the symbols of the One China policy. And if you wanted to create an unnecessary, artificial and early tripwire for crisis escalation, conflict and war, then there's nothing like fooling around with the One China policy through highly symbolic acts to bring you closer to the precipice. And that's one of the reasons why I oppose the visit. Through no lack of affection for Taiwan, I studied there as a student. Um, I know what it's like. I've got stacks of friends in Taiwan. I've seen it evolve over the years. Uh, but you've got to ask yourself two questions. Is Taiwan more secure or less secure as a result of the Pelosi visit? I would argue less secure because the People's Republic of China have now normalized a new set of military drills and behaviors in and around the island, including uh, trial blockades of maritime trade and air traffic, uh, which uh, in my mind have in fact brought China, brought Taiwan closer to the precipice than it was before. Why do you think the U.S. did it? Because they're already locked in a lot of conflicts, um, indirectly involved in what's happening in Ukraine and, of course, the sanctions war with Russia. Does the U.S. have the appetite to open another front with a country like China? Well, as you know, the United States, by its constitutional arrangements, is a divided government. The Congress does not do what the executive tells it to do. And the judiciary never does what anybody tells it to do, um, whether it's uh, the executive or the legislature. And so for those reasons, um, uh, Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House was free to do what she so chose. But I think the real politics of it was something like this. Um, Pelosi would only have chosen not to go had she been explicitly directed by her friend and former congressional colleague Joe Biden. And Joe wasn't going to be in the business of telling the Speaker of the House what to do, because um, in many respects, uh, Joe would then have been have uh, castigated as having been weak in the eyes of um, the Republicans in particular. So for those reasons, the visits proceeded. I just don't think it's wise. Again, um, it doesn't pay to fool around with this stuff. There's a difference between active contribution to deterrence and defence and military and economic and foreign policy support for Taiwan on the one hand, and simply uh, poking China in the eye on the other. If there were to be an armed conflict, a war in the Taiwan Straits, or whatever is happening, you've said that they've normalized these military drills and so on and so forth. How do you think it will impact, if it does, China's other conflicts, like its boundary dispute with India? I think what we're seeing across the board is an increasingly assertive and emboldened China uh, as a product of its self-perception of its expanded military and economic power. And as I indicated uh, earlier, turbocharged by the particular leadership style of Xi Jinping. And here in Delhi, of course, you've had across that span of time a series of not just incidents, but outbreaks of um, Chinese um, military actions along the uh, disputed border with India including most recently, of course, in 2020. So what I would suggest is that this is part of a pattern of behavior in all four theaters. You would ask logically, if you were Xi Jinping, why do this on four fronts at once? And that's a question I'm sure his internal political and military strategists would ask him as well. But Xi Jinping, in my experience, has only one approach to these sorts of challenges and opportunities, which is to double down to keep going and to go harder. And when I look at particularly the evidence of what's happened in and around the most recent clashes on the Sino-Indian border, the rapid construction of advanced um, infrastructure in and around the border on the Chinese side, by the Chinese side, new air facilities, um, new uh, roads being constructed, it strikes me that uh, what China is doing on the Sino-Indian border, as in the South China Sea and as in the East China Sea, is to change the circumstances on the ground over time. 
It has been suggested here in India that if China were to invade Taiwan, it would serve as a message for Arunachal Pradesh. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, as you know, the history of um, China's claims in relation to what is now and should be sovereign Indian territory uh, is, uh, is a long and complex one. My overall judgment would be as follows. If Taiwan was successfully taken by China, uh, knowing the nature of the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party would then feel emboldened across the other three frontiers that I referred to. And therefore, on the specific nature of what China would do in terms of all, as it were, the um, sub-elements of the very long disputed border uh, with India, I couldn't comment. But I think it would be fair to say that if Taiwan was suddenly under China's belt, so to speak, um, that the nature of Xi Jinping is to continue to press advantage. He doubles down. How do you assess India's current equation with, with China? Because this is, a, this is a clearly expansionist, aggressive neighbor who also happens to be India's, one of India's top trade partners. In terms of India's uh, foreign policy settings, um, I know um, Foreign Minister Jai Shankar well. Uh, I've known him from the time he was a career diplomat. And I know his extensive experience in relation to China. So I think India's uh, strategy is summarized by the foreign minister after the most recent visit here by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, is about right, where he said pretty bluntly to our Chinese friends, there can be no normalization of the general relationship until the border itself is normalized and resolved. Um, and of course, that remains a fundamental elemental a consideration for the future of the EU, of the China India relationship. How does the Chinese leadership view India? In terms of modern India, I think um, my conclusion, as I deal with Chinese think tanks quite a bit still, despite COVID, is that uh, the Chinese system's quite respectful of uh, Prime Minister Modi's India. They've seen him re-elected with a thumping majority. They've seen redirection of uh, Indian strategic policy most acutely manifested in the Quad um, and it being elevated now to summit level. Uh, they've seen a, an Indian economy now growing quite robustly, um, notwithstanding COVID, at between 6 and 7% annually. And China's slowing uh, for a range of reasons, largely self-induced. So for those reasons, um, I think what permanently puzzles the Chinese is how can 1.3 to 4 billion people be a robust democracy, given their only historical script in their mind is that it has to be autocratic. So for all these reasons, I think uh, there is perhaps a grudging respect, uh, but a high degree of respect, I think, for, uh, for India under, under Prime Minister Modi. And I think they were surprised at a military level by the degree of pushback on the border in 2020. I think they were militarily surprised. How do you read uh, Putin's relationship with Xi Jinping? I come back to that. And do you think that both sides see the fact that Putin is now increasingly looking like the junior partner? Xi Jinping definitely sees himself now as a senior partner in this relationship. The turning point in my observation was the first uh, Ukraine war of 2014. I remember being in Moscow at the time. Um, and uh, it was quite plain then talking to Russian analysts of the Russia-China relationship, that this was not a particularly close relationship back then. But as a product of uh, Russia's uh, diplomatic, political, economic, strategic isolation in the period following the annexation of Crimea, that China filled that vacuum big time. You mentioned the Quad in the course of our conversation, and um, the Quad has emerged as, as, as a grouping which is taking some sort of clear direction finally after all of these years. And I know you've, you've defended yourself against this, but you've been accused of having torpedoed the Quad uh, in, in the past when you were the Prime Minister. How do you see their progress and their relevance today? Do you think they've made up their mind on what they want to do? Well, given you raised my alleged torpedoing, I have to respond to that. Uh, and the truth of the matter is I didn't, because Quad Mark I, launched by Shinzo Abe in 2007, had already been torpedoed by... Abe's replacement by Prime Minister Fukuda in Japan before I was elected, and by Manmohan Singh in this country, having already indicated on a state visit to China that he was not pursuing the Quad himself, and the previous Australian Conservative government 
having made the same declaration in Beijing itself through the then Conservative Defence Minister, all before I was ever elected. That's the historical truth here. However convenient it may be for some in Delhi or Washington or Tokyo to say, this guy did it. He didn't. I just looked around and said, there's nobody here anymore, which I think is a fair and reasonable response. You broke the news to the world. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. In terms of the quad as it uh, has subsequently involved, my judgment is that geopolitically it's a natural and normal response to China's um, increasing power on the one hand, but more importantly, the increasing assertion of Chinese power on the other. Indeed. Uh, for those who follow foreign policy and international relations, I think this is a very exciting time to be around. There's so much that's happening. We talk too about, exciting. Yeah, you could say that. We talk about the reshaping of the world order and a whole lot of things. But I think at some level you wonder that is it personal egos that are deciding the course of this world and history indeed. If you were to find yourself in a room with Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin and Joe Biden today, what would you tell them? that the rest of us in the world expect the world's great powers and those who aspire to that status to manage their competitive relationship and to manage it peacefully because the rest of us were affected by it. The rest of Asia will be massively affected by a general war between China and the United States over Taiwan, a massive effect for all of us, not just in terms of the economic impact, can you imagine the impact, for example, in terms of uh, refugees? What would happen as a consequence of uh, a full-scale military invasion of Taiwan? It would be horrific. And ultimately, I'm a bit old-fashioned, you know. I actually don't like war. I just think war is generally a bad idea. I agree. I'm not a pacifist. My father fought in the Second World War. Uh, and uh, you do what you have to do. And you, have to, you do what you need to do to deter any potential enemy. And if uh, war becomes unavoidable, then of course you fight. Because we all fight for our, our nearest and dearest and the values for which we stand. But I actually detest war. And most military men and women that I know detest it as well. The profession of arms is something they'd prefer never to deploy in the battlefield. And they weren't called upon to do so. So therefore, for these great powers, China and the United States, it's not an unreasonable ask for the rest of us to say, manage strategic competition. Uh, it's not rocket science. <laughs> it's not just good for both of you. It's not just good for the people of Taiwan. It's good for the rest of the world as well. Would you offer India as, as an example of how strategic competition is managed? Uh, I've never thought of it in those terms. Uh, I'm not an expert on India. I know a lot about China because I've studied Chinese all my life. I'm a frequent visitor to this country, so I'm always cautious about what I say about India. But one thing I will observe about India um, is not only have you succeeded in sustaining this remarkable, grand democratic experiment in a country this size, which continues to be a marvel in the eyes of the world, and secondly, grow an economy in the way in which you are doing, uh, but you've also managed to have about you still uh, an ability to manage, albeit with difficulties, I'm not naive about this, high levels of diversity within this country. The alternative is what you see in Xinjiang. So I think against those measures, there's something for the world to look at in terms of what uh, Mother India has to offer. You're not perfect, but we Australians are, are much uh, more imperfect than you. So. Well, it's an imperfect world. You make the best of it. That's true. That's true. And, you know, I, um, as I said, the only reason I've written this book is because I started to get worried about where this is all going. Genuinely worried. It's an avoidable war. If we're careful in our study of it, of the conditions we face at present, deeply mindful of the importance of deterrence, including the role of multilateral institutions like the Quad, very mindful of our own national defense efforts in India, Australia, Japan, elsewhere, mindful of our relationship with the United States, but also with a keen eye on diplomacy of how we can find that uh, peaceful way through. I look forward to reading it and I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Certainly. It's been good to be with you. Thank you.